Good morning. It is a joy to be here. It's a joy to see each of you, and I especially would like to extend a welcome to you if you're visiting with us today. Maybe this is your first or second visit. Special, special welcome to you. I hope you feel at home and enjoy the time of ministry here today. Uh, you may hear it in my voice. I'm a little under the weather, so I um, apologize for that. I did want to look in the bulletin with you, though. Uh, there's a little prayer sheet in here. It's marked Prayer Points. And um, I'm just going to pick the middle one on the front of the page. I just would like to read it. What I do every Sunday afternoon, I'll do it today, is as soon as I get home, I try to um, go over the message, go over the verses, and um, pick some thoughts that are clearly biblical. They're clearly the Word of God, the will of God for us, and then just make them into a something we can pray about. And the reason it's important to pray according to the will of God can't ever be underscored enough, but the Bible says if we pray according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. For example, if you were to uh, be praying about your marriage and you were saying, Lord, I know it's your will to straighten my wife out. <laughs> I, I mean, excuse me, I, that's not what I meant to say. That was a slip. What I meant to say is, Lord, you know it's your will to straighten me out. That's what I meant to say. No, but in all seriousness, if you were to pray, Lord, I know you want our marriage to be a certain way. You want me to love my wife. You want me to serve her. You want me to be a, a man of integrity, of honesty, etc. God, of course, is going to respond to that. So that's just a little example of let your communication with God be along the line of his will. So I'm just going to read what from last week in number two there. As Jesus and the disciples began their journey across the lake, Jesus took a nap. He must have been a Christian because every Christian naps on Sunday. And then a very ferocious storm came upon them. The boat began filling with water and they were in danger, real de jeopardy, or so they thought. This is exactly how storms or trials can come into our lives suddenly. We can have the same idea the disciples did, that we are in real danger, and in fact, we may be. Be that as it may, let's pray for our body and those who have fallen into a trial or some very troubling circumstance. Let them not forget God, forget his word, or forget his promise to be with them. Help them and see them through. The, see them through. the disciples had lost sight of what Jesus had said, which was, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. They were in a state of fear and shock. May God's spirit come upon our body, and in particular, those who are in some horrendous situation. Bring them back to a place of peace and rest in the Lord. May God show us who we might reach out to offer help, comfort, prayer, and loving support. So uh, these are great ways to pray, and we put those there for you to use during the week. Also, there's a free book available today, again, out in the lobby. And uh, we've been giving these out over the last couple of weeks, especially if you're new here. Uh, this is a book I wrote. It's the, my own story of how I was converted. And the second part is my calling to ministry. And it's uh, filled with scripture and teaching. And it's a gift to you. Please take one for yourself and one to give away to a friend. And uh, maybe God will use it to help that person. We're in the book of Luke this morning. Wednesday nights, we're in the book of 2 Corinthians, but we're in Luke chapter 8 this morning. If you wouldn't mind standing, please, with me. I'd like to read to you. 
Again, my apologies for my voice. I have to speak a little slower and quieter so my voice will hold up. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day, excuse me, uh, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons. In fact, we'll be told there were 6,000 of them who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs or the cemetery. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Then Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him, and they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain, and they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Father, as we pause now to just pray. I ask, Lord, that you might help each of us in a very brief moment, in a quick moment, bring to our minds something great, Lord, that you've done for us. There's an old gospel tune that says, count your blessings, name them one by one. Lord, the greatest blessing is that you gave Jesus to die for our sins, and he did. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And your Holy Spirit has found many of us and your goodness has led us to turn our lives away from sin and come back to God. That is the supreme blessing of being saved. And Lord, you've done so many things for us. You've helped us. You are helping us. And you will help us. We pray now this morning as we read through this passage that you would teach us and that, Lord, we might respond in obedience to you. We ask, Lord, if there's anything amiss between 
you and us, that, Father, we would turn from it, we would be honest before you, we would agree with you, we would get right with you. Thank you for being so gracious. Thank you for receiving us. And we ask, Lord, also that the Holy Spirit might baptize us in the Spirit today. We pray finally for people in this room who are like this man, that they are in some fashion trapped. You set him free. We pray for those who are trapped here today, that today you would set them free. You are Lord God Almighty. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When they were in the storm and thought they were going to perish, they, of course, woke Jesus up and he calmed the storm and they didn't know what to think of this. And they got to the other side. Jesus was teaching them a lesson and the lesson had to do with their faith because he asked them, he said, where is your faith? And the lesson he was seeking to teach them was, if I tell you something, which he had told them, let's get in the boat, we're going to the other side. And on your way to where Jesus has told you to go, or as you're going along in the will of God, when a storm hits you, remember to simply believe what Jesus told you. Don't allow the circumstances to get your mind and your heart off of God. When he said, where is your faith? That's essentially what he was saying to them. What happened? I told you we were going to go to the other side. The storm was just a storm, but I want you to trust me. So they learned a valuable lesson. You could call it a victory. Jesus certainly demonstrated his power over the natural forces of nature. In fact, one of the Gospels tells us that it was Satan who brought that storm on. And now as Jesus and the disciples make it to the other side and they get out of the boat, they're immediately met by a man who was demon-possessed. There's a brief little thought here to share with you before we get into the text. Many times, uh, temptations and attacks from the devil come right on the heels of blessing. God can bring great, great blessing into your life, and Satan will wind up his bow and his arrow, as it were, and he'll aim it right at you. And that happened. Because when they arrived in that region, as Jesus was getting out of the boat, we're told that there was a man there who was possessed by demons, and the man came to meet Jesus. He had been in this condition for a long time. He was homeless. He was naked. He was living in a cemetery outside of town. You have to try to picture that. And as soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked. Hard to understand what that must have sounded like, but he fell down in front of Jesus. Then he screamed out. And he asked Jesus a question. He said, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, the son of the most high God? Little side note that we'll look at a little more in depth later, but the demons have a much, they have a very, very good theology, much better than many Christians. They, this particular man who was possessed by 6,000 demons called Jesus appropriately 
son of the most high God. He understood that Jesus is God. He also begged Jesus not to torture me. You see, the demons believe in hell. Many people don't believe in hell, but the demons sure do. And they know that's where they're going to wind up. And we'll talk more about demons in just a few moments. But he begged him not to torture him because Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out. And that spirit would often take control of the man, even during those times when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles. He simply, through the supernatural power of demons, someone in our congregation asked me about that word supernatural a while ago. We live in the natural world here, the visible world. There's a spiritual world, and the word supernatural is just referring to that invisible spiritual world. And by the way, the demons are much more powerful than we are here in this natural world. But he had supernatural demonic power, and he would break those chains, and then he'd just rush out into the wilderness completely under the demon's control. And so G Jesus then asked him a question, a very simple one. He said, what is your name? Legion, which means it's a Roman term, military term, 6,000 demons inhabited this man. Can you imagine 6,000 demons? He was filled with many demons. And the demons kept begging Jesus not to send them to the bottomless pit, which many believe is in the center of the earth where there are some demons that are already chained and being reserved for judgment. It's different than hell. They believe in the judgment of God. Many Christians don't believe in it. They said, don't send us to the bottomless pit. They didn't want to go there. There was a large herd of pigs in that area and the, the demons kept begging Jesus. They started to beg him, please let us enter the pigs. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about demons other than what's told us in the Bible, but they don't like to be without a house. They don't like to not be inhabiting something, be it a human being or be it an animal. In fact, we're told a little story in the Bible of a man who was freed from demons, but he didn't get his life right with God. And seven more demons came back and filled his life up. So they said, could we go into those pigs? There were a couple of thousand of them. So the Lord gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and they entered the pigs, and when they did, the entire herd ran off the cliff down into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. Not original with me, but those were the first deviled hams. <laughs> so the next time you read deviled ham, you'll remember Luke 8. It's great to laugh, but nobody else was laughing. And demons are not a funny subject. Now when the herdsmen, the guys who were taking care of these pigs saw this, what they did is they went to the nearby town and all of the surrounding countryside and they started spreading the news of what had happened as they ran, much like Paul Revere. And people who heard about this, they rushed out to the location there. I've been there, by the way, to see what happened. And a crowd soon gathered around Jesus. And guess what they saw? They saw that man 
who had been freed from the demons, and guess how he looked? Well, he was first of all no longer running around. He was sitting quietly at Jesus' feet. He was fully clothed. We're not told where he got the clothes. And he was perfectly sane. And everybody who saw this was afraid. And then those who saw what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. So the crowd came to see, they saw it, but then those who saw the actual exorcism, they told the crowd exactly how it had happened. And all the people now, that entire group, the herdsmen and all the people from that region, guess what they did? They begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. They said, go away. They were so afraid. Guess what Jesus did? He, he accepted their request. He got back into the boat and he went back to the other side of the lake. And the man who had been freed from the demons, he begged Jesus. He said, can I go with you? And Jesus told him, no. He said, you can't. He said, I want you to go back to your family. Go to your home. And I want you to tell them, your family, everything that God has done for you. So he went through the town all, he went all through the town proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. So he didn't just tell his family, but he went through the whole town where he lived, and he told them all, this is what Jesus did for me. Now let me just kind of take the story from the end and go back up. A little thought for you. Sometimes we ask the Lord, can we do this? Can I do this? Can I go with you? Would you do this for me? Can I go in this particular way or this ministry or whatever it might be? And a lot of times the Lord just says no. But if he says no, he also has something else for you to do. And in this case, the man was very compliant. He, he obviously wanted to go with Jesus, but he was very compliant. And he did exactly what Jesus asked him to do. And by the way, he was a very effective missionary. He was a very effective evangelist. As Brent said, you know, use that Saturday night as a tool of evangelism. By the way, off script, I want to proclaim next Saturday as Men's Day at Calvary Chapel. Okay, can we make a resolution? Are you, could everybody in favor say aye. Okay, that's, here's what it means. We're starting with breakfast and we're ending up with basketball, okay? So it's Men's Day at Calvary Chapel. So wives, encourage your men to get fed in the morning and uh, fellowship in the morning and go and get fed at night and, and enjoy fellowship at night. So next Saturday is Men's Day. But listen, this guy was so effective that the Bible tells us the next time Jesus visited that area of the Gadarenes, guess what the people did who had told him to go away? They now welcomed him and they recognized him and they welcomed him. So if God is saying no to you and he's sending you somewhere else, do what God tells you to do. You go and you tell people what great things God has done for you. You tell them. But let me talk to you about the people, the, the herdsmen a little bit, uh, because they're quite a group, the herdsmen. Um, and the townspeople, in fact, are quite a group. They are the ones who didn't want Jesus to be around. They told him to go away. And when you get down to it in Christianity and in church, all mankind, everybody reacts to Jesus Christ in one of two ways. It's either away with him or it's be with him, one or the other. All of us belong in one of those two camps. Every one of you that are here, you're in one of those two camps. The 
people who may be watching via the internet, it would apply to you as well. It applies to me, those who may be listening on the radio, it applies to you. Well, you may object to that. You may say, well, you know, I, I admit that I've not made a real commitment to Christ. I haven't declared that I want to be, you know, with him in this way, but I've not set away with him. I just simply haven't made up my mind yet. I'm just kind of in limbo. But Jesus said, whoever is not for him is against him. There's no middle ground. We either pray for him to go away or we pray for him to be near us. You're in one of those two camps. Which is it for you? Which camp are you in today? In the 41 years that I've been a Christian, I can say that I have noticed three ways in which people say, go away to Jesus. For some, it happens in church, oddly enough. The Spirit of God begins to work on their hearts, and they realize that the message of Christ is both true and it's what they need. Some people even feel a real joy in making this discovery. It's quite exciting for them. Yet, because of concern over what their friends or their family might think, or out of fear of being mocked, they resist the Spirit and they shake off His influence. They're afraid that if I really give my life to Christ, people are going to ridicule me. What's my wife going to say? What's my husband going to say? What will my coworkers say? Well, I can tell you this. They're going to give you a hard time, plain and simple. So you can know that up front. Paul said, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You make a stand for Christ, you will be mocked. You make a stand for Christ, you will be ridiculed. You make a stand for Christ, you will be persecuted. A lot of other things that will happen to you too, the blessing side of it. But what happens with a lot of people in church is they're afraid of that. They're more concerned, they're just afraid of what people are going to say. So they, they basically say, well, I'm not going back to church because it's too confrontational for them. So in essence, they're saying, go away, Jesus, away with you. For others, the rejection happens not at church, but through a chosen lifestyle. God has clearly shown them in his word what is right and what is wrong, but they decide to do what pleases them rather than what pleases God. They determine to divorce their husband or wife, whether they have biblical grounds or not. They just want out, and that's that. Or maybe they choose to continue in a sexual relationship with a person to whom they are not married. And let me interject here. Or to continue in pornography, which I think is so widespread in the church. I think it would blow our minds if we knew how many Christians are engaging in pornography. They think, well, God will forgive me. That's what they think. Or perhaps they, de they decide to continue abusing drugs. Now, the use of prescription drugs, using them properly is not abuse. But you can abuse prescription drugs, or you can use illegal drugs, or you can abuse alcohol. Despite what God has spoken to their hearts and their conscience, through their conscience, their friends or his word, they, they just keep going. And all those who consciously choose an ungodly lifestyle are in effect saying, away, Jesus, go away. You see, you're making your choice. Jesus is trying to get to you, and you're saying no and you're continuing to go 
and involve yourself in things that are not right. There's another third group, though. And I think a lot of people are in this group. They, they reject Christ simply by getting busy with other things. For them, it's nothing so blatant as deliberately breaking God's commandments. They're not that way. For they, what, they just, what they do is they just consume themselves with things like work. It's all they do is work. They work, 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 work. Or with recreation, that becomes their God. Or with home life. Or with any and everything but Jesus. By their actions, these folks are also crying away with Jesus. Let me say this to you. This church should be filled up on Wednesday nights with as many people as we have that come here between both services. There is what we call a midweek service here on Wednesday night. Many of you cannot attend church on Wednesday night because you have other responsibilities that you must tend to. But I believe personally, and I could be wrong, it would only be the first time in my life, but I could be wrong. But I believe most of you could come to church on Wednesday night if you wanted to. Most of you. What do you do on Wednesday? Could you do it on Tuesday? Could you do it on Monday? Could you do it on Thursday? Could you do it on Friday? Could you do it on Saturday? Probably. Why don't you clear the decks? Do you want your children to grow up thinking that Jesus is important? Do you? I'm sure you do. Well, well, then why don't you lead by example? You say, well, my kids don't like coming to church. Too bad, so sad. Bring them anyways. We have a great children's ministry here. If they say to you, well, I don't like coming to church, say, gosh, you're just like me. I don't like going either, but I, I should, and I'm gonna. Some people, most people, the only time they read their Bible is right now on Sunday morning. Look, if you came on Wednesday nights, you would increase your Bible reading 100%. How about that? I mean, that's, where else do you get 100% return on your investment? That's pretty big stuff. And, like the guy on TV, and that's not all, <laughs> do you know what happens to people who start reading the Bible intentionally, regularly? Do you know what happens? It creates something within them. Do you know what that is? It's a hunger for, for what? For God. For the word of God. So pretty soon you're being satisfied, but you want more and more of Jesus. Do you know what happens to people who want more of Jesus and more of the word of God? Do you know what happens? Your life begins to change. What happens is your life begins to get closer to God. And I'm sure if I were to ask every one of you who are Christians, do you want to be close to God? You'd say, yes, I do. Well, then do what it takes to get close to God. Here's a promise from God. I'll quote it again later, but draw near to God and he will do what? He'll draw near to you. If I were to say to you, hey, do you want to go to Hawaii? You'd say, yeah. I'd say, well, then here's how you go to Hawaii. You got to get on a plane and go to Hawaii. You can't just sit around and say, oh, I want to go to Hawaii. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just wishing I want to go to Hawaii. Well, why don't you go? So I want to exhort you. I want to admonish you. As you see the day of the Lord drawing closer, I want to exhort you to love one another and to good works. All the more as you see the day approaching.
do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I want you to just think about it right now. What do you do on Wednesdays? Could you come to church? Bring your Bibles with you. If you don't have a Bible, we'll buy you a Bible. You need to have your own Bible. You see, these people here, this was their business, raising pigs. Jesus was bad for their business. You may be even willing to admit that Jesus is bad for your business, but he's great for your soul, I'll tell you that. He can deliver you from anything, anything. Not only from a miserable past or a miserable present, but also from present sins, he can deliver you. Whatever they may be, he can and will do that unless you do what the Gadarenes did and send him away. Tell Jesus to leave you alone, and guess what he'll do? He'll leave you alone. Tell him often enough, and the time will come when you've run out of opportunities to repent. It'll be too late. But today, you still have time. So I ask you this question, which is it for you? away with Jesus or Lord take all of my life because we just sang this song a few moments ago we sang one of the lines in that song lead me you know I can't remember them but lead me where my feet have never gone or something like that right take my faith out you're going to be with me and so on it, it's an expression of Lord I want to go with you If Jesus is bad for your business, it's time for you to get a new line of work. What about demons? Let's just talk a little bit about demons for a moment. A lot of people want to know about them. They're really in this story here. Just as there are angels who look out for your welfare, and do you know that there are? We do have what are called ministering they're called ministering spirits some people call them guardian angels but that's not quite in the bible but they are watching out for you there's they're right here with us today and there are also angels who are bent upon your destruction so that's interesting isn't it you've got one group of these angels who want to help you and one group that wants to destroy you the bible teaches this that when satan fell from heaven, he took one-third of the angels with him. Revelation 12, 4 tells us that. Although we don't know their exact number, Scripture tells us in Luke 2, verse 13, that there was a great multitude. Um or the Bible teaches that there was a great multitude. In fact, it's an innumerable number. It's actually a number, but it's a hyperbole. It's so many. There's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's all types of angelic beings. There's certain creatures around the throne of God, but there are three archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Each of them had a particular job that God assigned them to. Lucifer's job was one involving praise. And he had the problem of being discontent. He was not content with the position that God had placed him in. And he, wanted, he didn't want to be what he was. He wanted to be something different and he specifically wanted to be like God. He was very prideful. This is why God hates pride. He hates it. And by the way, pride is so entrenched in our systems, that's why the Bible warns about leaders, don't put a young Christian in a position of leadership. 
lest he fall into the same temptation that the devil did. God does a work in a man or a woman's life to humble them and to work with that area of pride because leadership is all about exalting Christ, not yourself. And unless God deals with your pride, you will exalt yourself and not God. And then God will have to humble you. So pride is a very, very, very dangerous thing. I've read about it. I'm sure glad I don't have a problem with it. But you know, it's this very thing of not being content that gets people in trouble. You know, the great apostle Paul, we call him the great apostle Paul. And he was the great apostle Paul. He didn't use those terms, we do. But do you know that he wasn't always the great apostle Paul? That he was a man always, just like you and I, with the same nature as ours. He had to start out his Christian life. And he had to learn, just like you and I learned. You know what one thing he learned? He learned to be content in whatever state he was in. If he was in Florida, Oklahoma, New Mexico, it didn't matter. Whatever state he was in, whether he was abounding or whether he was abased, whether things were going well or things were going hard, he was content. And when a person isn't content, what happens is they start kind of paving their own way and carving their own way instead of letting God lead them where he wants them to go. That can get you in a lot of trouble. That's what happened to Satan. So he led a third of the angels. They, they hooked on with Jesus. They joined in. So Satan has a sizable, imagine, one-third of the angels, a sizable, highly organized force under his control. I'll bet you none of you or me have ever really stopped to consider how widespread and how many angels he has working for him. You know, if we were in intelligence in the military, we would know right to the man how many people are in the army of every country. We know their weapons. That's why we have undercover secret operatives to figure out what do, the, what do they have. Satan has a huge army. They're very, very well organized. These fallen angels are also known in the Bible as demons. That's what they're called. And they help Satan to accomplish his purpose. That's, that's what they're doing right now. They're helping him try to accomplish his purpose, which in the words of Christ are to steal. He's a thief. You say, well, what is it that he wants to steal? Well, what did he steal from Adam and Eve in the garden? He stole the word of God, didn't he, in a, in a sense. He wants to take the word of God away from you. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. That's basically what his mission is. He wants to do. You see, God is seeking to build you up. It's like building a house. Satan is in the demolition business. He's got a big wrecking ball, and he's just driving around every day saying, well, who's next? And he's got jackhammers and everything else and explosives. While the Bible doesn't give us specific details as to how demons work, and I was, it was interesting, a young man I'm discipling asked me the other day, he said, how do the demons actually get a thought into your mind? And I said, well, I don't really know, but they do. The Bible says they do. The best we know is they have what are called fiery darts. That's how the Bible describes them. They can't read your mind, but they certainly 
know where you are. They can see you. They, you know, they're not equal to God. They're far superior to you. You are vulnerable to them if you're not underneath the Lord's leadership. If you're standing up in Christ, armored in Christ, you will stand well against them. If you're not armored in Christ, you won't stand well at all. If you turn your back on Jesus and go the other way, you're in big trouble. Soldiers were outfitted primarily to protect their front because that's how you do battle. You don't, you don't go into battle backwards trying to fight your enemy backwards. You, you go right at them. So they were equipped to protect their front. Now imagine if a soldier turned his back. He would be very, very vulnerable. And when you turn your back on the Lord through disobedience, Satan can have a heyday with you. And he will, believe me. So we don't have all the details. We only have what God has given us, but we can be confident that everything we do need to know about them is found in the Scripture. And the Bible says this concerning the devil. Just be wise and simple about him. You don't need to get all shook up about it. I'd be careful about reading all these books about the devil. Read books about Jesus. Read books about the Father. Read books about the Holy Spirit. Read the books and autobiographies and biographies of great men of God. Read good Christian literature that talks about the Lord, about the church. And you'll do just fine concerning the devil. We do not need to look elsewhere for insights into the spiritual world. We see what God's word has to say about these evil agents. Let me tell you three things. First of all, turn with me to James, please, chapter 2. Three quick things about the devil. James chapter 2. And it, could we get a little bit of cooler air, please, Phil? Thank you. Here in James chapter 2, we see what demons believe. Strange as it may seem, demons do acknowledge that there is only one God. Look what it says in verse 19 of James chapter 2. James speaking to the believers, he said, You believe there is one God? You do well. It's a good thing if you have good theology about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even the demons believe. They have good theology. In fact, I would venture to say the demons have better theology than most Christians. And they tremble. They're so afraid of God. They know so much about Him. They tremble, and they ought to. If you'll turn with me to the book of Acts, please, chapter 19 for a moment. Acts chapter 19. People wonder, can demons personally harm you? Well, let me say this, those people who have a true relationship with Christ cannot be overcome by demons, but those who do not are fair game for the servants of the devil. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant or traveling Jewish exorcists, <coughs> excuse me, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we adjure you or we solemnly command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So these guys were going around 
using the name of Jesus towards these demon-possessed people, and here's what happened to them. In verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. How about that? They stripped their clothing off, wounded them, and these guys ran for the hills. Verse 17, this became both known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So it, it brought about a kind of, it brought about a glorification of the name of Christ, the person of Christ, and a conviction into the lives of many believers so that they actually came confessing their evil deeds and telling their evil deeds. Also, verse 19, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. 50,000 pieces of silver. It was a tremendous amount of money. In fact, if the silver drachma is meant here, the value would have been the equivalent of about 138 years' pay for a rural laborer. That's a lot, isn't it? Let's go to Luke 10 for just a moment, please, and deal with one other matter. We know what demons believe. They believe all the things that are true. We know demons can harm you, and we'll talk in a few moments about your own personal way of standing against him, but what makes demons powerless? The name of Jesus was used by the followers of Jesus, and it makes the demons tremble. Look in Luke chapter 10, in verse 17. This follows a long description of a mission that the disciples were sent on and what they did in verse 17. Then the 70, there were 70 of them, returned with joy from their, their short-term mission, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So through the name and the person and the power of Christ, demons are subject to you. And he said to them, he said, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So his... When he rebelled and fell, he shot out of there like a bolt of lightning. How about that? He was in a hurry to get his deeds done. And then Jesus in verse 19 said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So God gives you the power over the enemy. He went on to say, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Don't be all rejoicing about the power you have over the enemy, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Don't you like that? I like that because that's the right focus. Again, don't get all focused in on the devil. Oh, boy, you know, the devil, and we knocked his teeth out. And people that talk that way, I just think, you are out there, man. Let's talk about Jesus. You rejoice that your name is written in heaven. 
Think about that for a moment. What should, what's more enjoyable, to know you have power over the devil or that there's a book in heaven and your name is in it? It's a no-brainer for me. A no-brainer. Well, let's talk for just a moment about the fact that God has a plan for your victory, but I want to just, before I do that, I want to just lay something on your mind here. Some of you, I think I may have already said something about this, but some of you here today are in a situation in your life where you are, in essence, you're trapped, like you're trapped like this man was. You, you can't, you're in a really bad spot. He was in a terrible spot. The whole community couldn't even contain him. He was isolated. He was hurting himself. He was cutting himself. He was a miserable soul. Can you imagine living in the cemetery? He had no friends. Some of you have things in your life that are, that are like this. You're not at peace. You're, you're bound by something. You're not free. You're encumbered. You're stuck. And I want you to just think about that. You know who you are. You know what it is, okay? And we'll return to this in just a moment. But let me just give you three quick thoughts about how you can resist the devil. First of all, simply know God's word. Just know God's word. You know, Eve had a choice to make in the garden, and had she stuck with the word of God, she would have done just fine, but she didn't. We need to know the word of God. The reason we do is when the enemy comes with his lies and his temptations and his distortions, we can use scripture offensively and defend ourselves too. I think it's true. I've never personally witnessed it. I've heard it a lot of times, but I'm told that bank tellers can identify the real from the fake very easily. Not that I've ever tried to pass off counterfeit money, but I've been told that they can. I once sold a truck for $20,000 cash, and I was so happy. Went to the bank with my $20,000 cash, plopped it down to deposit it, and then the lady started looking at them, and I realized for the first time, oh my goodness, what if this is counterfeit money? And the guy was long gone with my truck already. So I took out my guns and I started shooting. <laughs> Just shot right through the doors of the glass doors of the bank at him. No. And I, I, my heart started beating, and I thought, what if I'd been ripped off? And fortunately, I had not. But I'm told that what they do with the tellers is they, they, the way they can identify the, the fake is they don't show them the fake. They let them handle the real money. They know exactly how it feels. And when phony money comes across, of course, it's much more high-tech now, but when phony money comes across, they can just easily feel it. You need to know the Word of God. That's how you stand against the enemy. So getting back to my earlier exhortation, if you read the Bible once a week, I'm telling you, you're ill-equipped to, to deal with the enemy. Come and read it twice a week. Now you're in, you're in good shape. And you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to start reading the Bible more and more and more and more. It's just the way it goes. So you need to know the Word of God. Secondly, you just need to resist temptation. You may be wondering, well, why does God even allow temptation? Wouldn't life be a lot easier if God just took all temptation away and let us cruise through life until we get to heaven? Well, temptation, believe it or not, can have a very positive impact on our lives. 
Temptation separates the men from the boys, women from the girls, the wheat from the chaff, the true from the false. When you are a true child of God and you are tempted, you cling to God all the more. Here's what A.B. Simpson said. Temptation exercises our faith and teaches us to pray. It is like a military drill and a taste of battle to a young soldier. It puts us under fire and compels us to exercise our weapons and prove their potency. It shows us the resources of Christ and the preciousness of the promises of God. Every victory gives us new confidence in our victorious leader and new courage for the next onslaught of the foe. If you are not walking with the Lord, you will probably dabble with temptation. You may toy with it, and if you do, you will ultimately fall into sin. If, on the other hand, James 1.12 says this, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. When you resist temptation, you will grow stronger. But let me give you a word of warning. As I've mentioned earlier, temptation will often hit you during times of blessing and spiritual victory. Brace yourself. Many times after God has really ministered to you, or has used you, Satan will have his bow loaded with his flaming arrows and he will nail you. The third thing, first of all, know God. Secondly, know the word of God. Know God's word, resist temptation. But thirdly, draw near to God. We need to keep up our guard and stay as close to God as we can. You know, if you were in a battle and you knew your enemy was right across the street, you wouldn't just walk out in your front yard, you know, like, hey, it's a nice day out here today. You'd be walking out prepared. You'd be walking out on guard. It's a nice day in here today. But it's not a nice day out there, I can tell you. You need to be on guard. You need to stay as close to God as we can. I love these songs we sang, both first and second service. Just this thought, close to God, living close to God. The Apostle James tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and what? He will what? He will draw near to you. You see, the only way to effectively resist the devil is to draw near to God. Think about it. He's greater than the devil. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So if you draw near to him, you're drawing near to someone who is greater than the devil. And then you will have the power and the resources you need to resist enticements and temptations. And the only way to draw near to God is to come to him through his own son, Jesus Christ. The devil knows that too, but he doesn't want you to know it. So let me ask you this. That man who was filled with these demons, what a horrible life he had. But then he was sitting quietly, sanely, clothed, obedient to Christ, useful for Christ, telling people about Christ. He went from that one extreme of isolation to communication with people. He went from being shrieking and crying to praising and rejoicing because what was in him and what was upon him was now no longer in him and upon him. And it was because of Jesus Christ dealing with him. Now, Jesus 
can deal with you right here today. He can help you right here today. There's probably demons whispering in your ear right now that, he, oh, I don't believe it. Well, you know what I would say to you? Your unbelief doesn't change the fact that God is faithful. You cannot believe anything you want to. God remains faithful. So here's what I want to ask you. If our worship team can please come out. And if the ushers can get ready to receive our offering, they'll do that in, in just a few moments. Not just yet, but just in a few moments. But if our worship team can get ready to lead us in a chorus, whatever they're going to sing. Please listen to me. I'm asking you to have an encounter right now with the Lord Jesus Christ at the most difficult part of your life, whatever it is. And I'm asking you to ask Jesus Christ to set you free from that thing that has been holding you in bondage. It could be anything. It could be that you're bitter, you're angry, you're sad, you're afraid, you're caught up in things that you're not, you know, aren't right, you shouldn't be. I mean, it could be anything. It could be confusion. It could be a sense of despair. And you've gone to counselors, you've gone, you've read books, you've tried this and tried that, and you're still right where you were, maybe worse. What that man did is he came to Jesus. He actually bowed down to Jesus. We read the whole dialogue. I'm asking you to come to Jesus today and ask Jesus to set you free. That's a simple prayer, isn't it? He knows what it is. He knows what you're thinking right now. So here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you if you want the Lord to help you I want you to just stand to your feet and by standing to your feet, you're expressing your faith to God. You're saying, God, you don't need to, nobody's going to guess, they're trying to guess, well now is he in this, doing this, she doing that. That's not what it's about. If you want Jesus to help you, please stand to your feet. And don't just do herd mentality here. You stand in reverence, you stand with sincerity, you stand in honesty. Maybe some of you are not even saved. And you know you need to be saved. Why don't you stand to your feet? I can't set you free. I can't wave my hand and do some magical potion over you. My wife could, but I can't. My wife can do anything. At least that's what she tells me. But you know what? Our Lord Jesus Christ can he is the Lord Almighty. While we're standing, I want to remind you at 4 o'clock today, if you want to know the Word of God more, you come join your pastor because we have our discipleship class at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Okay? Just come. Even if you haven't come, some of you came, I saw you walk out. I thought, well, I don't know where you're going, but please come back. You come at 4 o'clock today. I'll help you. We'll get into the Word of God. So the team is going to lead us in song. You pray to Jesus Christ to set you free. And then if the ushers towards the end, we'll just come up for the offering, and then we'll be dismissed. <laughs>